Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to another edition of Crafting and Crime Daily, where I start the morning off with a cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. And I'm up early today for lots of reasons, and we'll, we'll go through that here soon. But today's Wednesday. There was testimony yesterday in this case that took Monday off. This is the case of Richard Merritt. He is on trial in Georgia, DeKalb County, Georgia, for the murder of his mother, Shirley Merritt, who at the time he was living with because he was in lots and lots of trouble for financial crimes he committed during uh, his law practice. So to start the day out, they were late starting because someone smelled smoke in the courtroom. Well, I guess they could all smell it. So they had to call the fire department in and have the fire department check for hot spots. They couldn't find anything. So court got started late. Then we find out that the prosecution is almost done with their case but they need the medical examiner to testify and she is not available. She won't be available till next week. So what they had to do was uh, put case law on the record that supports the calling of another medical examiner, someone that did not perform the autopsy, but who has reviewed the autopsy report, reviewed all the photographs, talked to whoever he needs to talk to, and then he can come in and give his opinion as to cause and manner of death. So that's what they had to do. And the defense said that they were not going to object as long as all the foundation was laid. Now, the foundation, by that they mean he had, she had to first call the custodian of records from the medical examiner's office to get the autopsy report and the photographs into evidence. So she did that. That's That was the first person on the stand. So now we've got all the autopsy photos. Of course, they didn't show any of them. Then they bring on the associate medical examiner. I think they had to thaw him out because he was older than God. They must have said, who do we, who do we have left in the office today? And, oh, 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 okay. Well, they need you in court. He was terrible older than God, older than God, and just hemming and hawing, and he just seemed so indecisive, and he kept throwing out these ancient terms, and, you know, when I went to school, because they have to talk about their background, well, when I went to college, it was called, the degree was called this, and I'm like, oh my God, when did you go to college, the 1800s? Um, I don't know. So, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, they go through the photos and he says that the, she had multiple stab wounds and the stab wounds were consistent with the blade that was found. Now, where did they find the blade? This is a question that I had raised earlier in the case. Where did they find this blade? It was in her cheek when they found the body of his mother. The blade was sticking out the bottom of her right cheek. And of course, they had to leave it that way and transport her that way to the medical examiner's office with this blade in her cheek. She had a handful of hair. And we found, we know from earlier testimony that the DNA was tested in that hair and it came back to her. It was her own hair. Then she, he talked about the skull wound that she had. He said it was... The, the blunt, it was a blunt impact of a blunt object consistent with the 35 pound dumbbell that she had suffered a fractured skull, which is the bone on the outside of your brain, as well as a basilar skull fracture, which means underneath the brain, there's some more bones. Those were fractured. She had subarachnoid hemorrhages, which are these little tiny hemorrhages throughout the brain. And she had a bruising of the brain, which they call a contusion. So what he said about the stab wounds is that those in and of themselves would not have 
killed her immediately. She would have been alive for several minutes, probably conscious. She would have been able to talk. She may have been able to walk around, but she probably would have quickly bled to death. He didn't say that in that wor the, those words, but he said she would have been dead within minutes of those stab wounds, but not right away. But the blunt force trauma to the head, yes, she would have been dead. That in and of itself would have killed her, but he said the cause of death was a combination of the blunt force trauma. I can't even reach these. <laughs> They're way over here. Hold on. The blunt force trauma and the stab wounds. So one of the questions that I had was, you know, when did she die? What's the time of death? Well, he said, unlike a lot of the television shows that people watch, it's time of death is not ever really a certainty. It's not something they can say for certain. There are signs that you can tell when a body has been dead for a little while, a few hours, and that's when rigor sets in, rigor mortis. And her body was in rigor mortis when it was brought to the medical examiner's office, which means she had been dead for a few hours when she was found. But other than that, you can't make any determination. Was it days? You know, it wasn't weeks or months because she would have started to decompose. But in any case, with certainty, he could not give a time of death. So the manner of death was homicide. Then they brought in an investigator from the medical examiner's office who testified th that when she arrived on the scene, there the knife was sticking out of the mom's cheek and she brought her to the examiner's office that way. But she was the person that opened the package that had the blade in it. This is the first time where they're seeing the blade. And she was a very soft-spoken woman, so I couldn't tell if she, she was upset or she was just, that's just the way she talked. Um, but anyway, it was she was on and off the stand very quickly. And then the prosecution rested their case. I'm like, wait a minute, that's it? Where's your evidence? <laughs> what happened? What? Um, so at the conclusion of the prosecution's case, the judge sends the jury out. The defense makes a motion for a judgment of acquittal. This is a routine motion that's always done at the finish of a prosecution's case. And what they argue to the judge is that the evidence was insufficient to that the jury could conclude beyond a reasonable doubt that his client committed this murder. And the judge, she was thinking about it. I got to say, she was thinking about it. Most of the time, these are like, now nah, denied, outright. So she says to the prosecution, what's, what's your argument? And they said, well, here, he was in this house. We know from the ankle monitor, he was home with his mother between 9.30-ish, 9.40 a.m. and 2.30. He leaves the home at 2.30. All those hours, he's with mom. Lunch is never eaten. And the judge is like, anything else? <laughs> she says, let me confer with my other lawyers. So that happens. She comes back and she goes, oh, the weapons were from within the home. Uh, and when the officers arrived on the home, it was locked up, tired in the drum. No signs of forced entry anywhere. So the judge said, okay, motion denied. But you could tell she was like, mm, she was giving it some thought <laughs> because it's not a strong case. It is very circumstantial, very circumstantial. Much like the Alex Murdoch. I feel like this is a repeat of the Alex Murdoch case. Anyway, so now it's time for the defense to present their evidence. And then we get to hear from Richard Merritt. He opts to take the stand. What is it with lawyers? They think they got to have the last word. I got to tell my story. Okay. Nobody's going to believe you. You committed financial crimes against your clients. Those are th 
Those are crimes of dishonesty. You're a liar. <laughs> We're not going to believe anything you say. Anyway, he wanted to tell his story. He was born, and I'm like, oh my God, we're going to go all the way back to his birth? Yes. I was born. Do you remember that movie, The Jerk? I'm dating myself here. <laughs> With Steve Martin. This was eons ago. And it starts out, he's like, I was born a poor black child. He was raised in a black family in this movie. I was born a poor black child. Anyway. I digress. Okay. Funny movie. If you ever want to see a funny movie. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. I know. I have weird sense of humor. I could. I'm really digressing. Okay. Back to the story. Okay. So <laughs> let's fast forward through the rest of his childhood. I was also born in Fort Belvoir, Virginia. This is the first time in my entire life I have ever met anybody who was born in Fort Belvoir, Virginia other than me. I thought I was the only one. Nope, it's me and Richard Merritt, born in Fort... His father was in the military. My father was in the military. This is the area of the military where you get stationed if you're in the Intelligence Bureau, uh, which my father was Army Intelligence, and his father was Air Force Intelligence. So then he talks about how we travel around and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, okay. So they end up in Georgia. He meets his wife at college, they get married, and he says, we were not the type of couple to sit at home at night and watch television. We were very social. I'm a lawyer, she's a doctor, we went, we had a lot of friends in the community, and we socialized a lot. Until his clients, from his private law practice, and he talked about, you know, it took me three times to pass the bar. I, I passed on the third try. He says, but I wasn't in any hurry. I had a job. So when he goes to start his law practice, his own law practice, mom foots the bill. Mom puts up the money for his own law practice. Fast forward, he has two kids. He's got his son, Jack, his daughter, Maya, who has cerebral palsy. He talks about how much he adores and loves his son and how much he adores and loves his daughter. And here's what's special about him. And here's what's special about her and blah, blah, blah. So he said something interesting that I thought, well, what? He said he voluntarily gave up his bar license. So what happened was initially one person, one client came out of the woodwork and said, hey, this guy sold $70,000 from me. So he gets charged with that theft. And then they start investigating him and find a total of 15 victims where he would say, you settled your case or I didn't say, I, you know, your case is still ongoing in litigation, but he had already settled the case and he was keeping the money for himself. Total of 15 victims he had to pay uh, when he was charged $526,000 in restitution. And then he was charged with 30 years, of which he would have to serve 15 years in prison, followed by 15 years probation. So he talked about initially when he is charged initially with those charges, 34 charges surrounding these 15 victims. He was under a $400,000 bond, which meant mom would have to come up with 10%. Someone would have to come up with 10%, $40,000. So he said it took his mom a couple of months. She had to take out a second mortgage on her home. And then she puts up the $40,000 for him to get out of jail. Fast forward to the sentencing hearing. Uh, he, you know, this is where he says he voluntarily gave up his law license. He says he and his wife gave up their home because neither of them wanted to live there. Now, that is not what she testified to. She testified that he didn't pay the mortgage for six months, and that's how they lost their home. He did not talk about selling his disabled daughter's 
van, the one that she needed to get the wheelchair around in. Didn't fail to mention that at all. But he did say that, yes, I did ask the court for two weeks to get my affairs in order. I wanted to say goodbye to the kids. I wanted to work out with my mom some some issues. So what are what, what are these issues? What are these things you got to work out with your mom? This is what I wanted to know. Like, who would get my stuff? Like, what is she going to do with my clothing and my things while I'm away for 30 years or 15 years? That's it? That's what he said. So... Part of the conditions of this $400,000 bond was that he wear this ankle monitor and he had a curfew. He had to be in the home by 5 p.m. and he could not leave before 8 a.m. Now, he got a job working at a pet store, Petco, I don't know. He had a job, got a job. So he got the curfew extended to midnight. So... Between midnight and 8 a.m., he had to be in his mother's home because that's where he indicated he was going to be living. He also said as a consequence of all of these financial crimes um, and these charges, his wife, his son, could no longer go to private school. He had to go to public school. Aw. And the daughter, she always went to public school because, you know, she... She gets all those disability benefits in, that you don't get in a private school. And he, she could get that at any public school. And he's, of course, talked about how his wife divorced him immediately, which he, he said it wasn't, you know, retrospectively, it, it was probably a good thing because it set herself apart from him. He said initially people believed she was in on it. Or maybe condoning it? I don't know. But the fact that she immediately divorces him sort of set her apart from him. Because she's a professional, and she, these are all her friends as well as his friends in the community. So he talks about mom. He says mom was not pleased with him over these crimes. Look, I, I diamond painted during... See, I can't do two things at once. I can't talk and, you know. <laughs> so he described her as being a steel magnolia. That she was a very strong Southern woman. He said, she and I both are very opinionated. We both speak our minds. But we had a lot of laughter. Then he talks about in the weeks going up to her murder and the day he was supposed to turn himself in, that there was an abnormal amount of cars driving by his mother's house. You know, they would slow down and then they would keep going. There was a lot of hangups on his cell phone and his mother's cell phone. She would show him the phone. Look, somebody's called and they hung up on me. People that were not in their contacts, they would call and they would hang up on them. So he felt like someone was out to get him. Then on January 14th of 2019, this is just a few days before his sentencing hearing, like four days before his sentencing hearing, a cartoon arrives at his mother's house in the mail and at his ex-wife's house, Janine in the mail and it's some kind of cartoon about his financial crimes and how you know people are going to be out to get him and so his mother was very upset by this cartoon to the point where she started getting chest pain she became dizzy she was having difficulty breathing but and this was later in the afternoon, and he knew because of his curfew that he was not going to be able to drive her to the ER and get her back home or get himself back home before midnight when his curfew set in. Yet now he's worried about the ankle monitor curfew. So mom drives herself to the emergency room. She's admitted she spends it like 
probably they put her on a cardiac monitor and they monitored her for 24 hours is what it sounds like. She gets out of the hospital on the 16th, two days later, and she comes back home and she's decided she's going to write a letter to his defense lawyer about this cartoon, I guess. They wanted him to do something about it, which he never did, according to Richard Merritt. I don't know what this cartoon was all about, to be honest with you. If I can find it, I'll throw this up in the video. But in any case, mom was fine health-wise. So he denied any violence towards his wife. I, I don't know if you guys recall, but she had said that he there was one time that he pushed her down and he said, no, that never happened. It never happened. He talked about what he did on February 1st. Now, I'm going to go ahead and play this part of the testimony for you because it was so bizarre. So bizarre. He talked about going to his doctor's doc daughter appointment after visiting uh, with the kids that Thursday night because he knew that Friday he had to turn himself in. Um, He also talked to his mom about, you know, they discussed whether she really needed her husband's cousin to come get her or come stay with her that weekend and help her take Richard to jail. He said, you know, this was a private affair between my mother and I, and we just wanted the time to ourselves. And so we both decided that she she really could get through it. She could drive me to the jail and get back and she'd be okay. So we we both texted, uh, what was his name? It was the cousin. What was the cousin's name? We're going back to day one of the testimony here. Mike Jeffcoat. So they both texted Mike and said, we really, we really don't need you. And we had seen those texts. He said he was very, very sad that day because he had to say goodbye to his kids. So it was a very sad day and he, he really need, had stuff he needed to discuss with mom and she was making his favorite meal spaghetti. And so the plan was that they would have lunch about one o'clock and then leave the house by two because this was Super Bowl this weekend. So the Atlanta traffic was crazy and he knew it would take them a while to get to the jail to get him there on time. Now, listen to what happens. And then what happened? It was, you know, the plan was we were going to eat around one o'clock so that we could be on the road by 2, no later than 2.30. It was, I believe, Super Bowl weekend, Friday afternoon traffic, a bunch of stuff going on in Atlanta. And, you know, obviously we don't want to be late to the jail, given the importance of me being on time. I was walking from the kitchen. I had just left the kitchen from keeping her company while she was making the spaghetti when I heard a very loud knock at the front door. We weren't expecting any visitors. So I went to the front door and I opened it. And there were two individuals there, two men, and they both were pointing pistols at me. And they told me to let them in. So what'd you do? I let them in. I had never seen these guys before and they were pointing pistols at me, so I let them in. I let them in, they shut the door. Uh, about this time, my mother came to the foyer where I was standing with these two individuals and they said, head to the basement and don't say an effing word. So did you go to the basement? The taller of the individuals 
He was older, probably in his 50s, about six feet, athletically built. Walked past me, put the gun at my mother's lower back, and she started to head towards the stairway to the basement. The fact they said head to the basement led me to think they knew we had a basement and had cased the house before. The younger of the men, he's probably about 5'8", five, 5'9", five, shoulder length brown hair, pudgy, he put his gun on my back and we followed them. She opened the stair door to the basement, flicked on the light. It was a two, two step process to get down those stairs. You had four or five steps that went down, there's a landing, and then you make the turn and there's the longer flight of stairs. They proceeded first. My mother was crying. She was making sounds like she might be wanting to scream or shout. And as they made the turn on the landing and took those first few steps, by this point, I and the guy behind me who had the gun on my back made it to the landing. He told her to shut the F up and pushed her down the stairs. And then what happened to your mother? It was the worst sound I've ever heard in my life. Um, she plunged headlong into the wall. It, it's a sound I can hear to this day as I'm sitting here. And I could tell that there was a dent or a hole in the wall. She was trying to get up and move around, but from my vantage point, she appeared like she couldn't get her balance. Was your mother injured at that time? And she certainly appeared to be. And as I moved like I was gonna to try to go down the stairs, the guy dug the pistol into my back and grabbed my shoulder. The gentleman who pushed her down the stairs, put his pistol behind his back into the, the back part of his jeans. He ran down the stairs, turned the corner, and came back with the 35 pounds weight that has been seen during the course of this trial. And where did the knife come from? Well, <laughs> the knife came later. Um, this monster took this dumbbell and proceeded to bludgeon my mother right in front of me. And she was, she stopped moving at this point. He then told the man who had his pistol in my back to bring me down to the bottom of the stairs. They shoved me over to the tile where the dumbbell rested. And then the older guy took off up the stairs. He came back a few minutes later with the kitchen knife and proceeded to stab my mother repeatedly in front of me. I, I cannot believe what I was seeing. I didn't understand what would be the purpose because she wasn't moving. Why is any of this happening? It was a complete and utter nightmare. So what did you do? There's nothing I could do. I had a, a pistol to my back. I couldn't believe this was happening. I had no clue who these people were or why they were doing this to us. So he stabbed her with such force that the handle broke off the knife. I didn't realize at the time that the knife was still stuck in my poor mother's face. He put the handle down on the tile across from the dumbbell. He then turned and looked at me and he pulled out his cell phone. And he proceeded to show me a picture of my ex-wife dropping Mia off at her school, a picture of Jack being dropped off or picked up at Lovett, a picture of them all getting out of her van at their rental home in Marietta, and a picture of her either coming or going from her clinic in Vinings. And he said, and I'll never forget this as long as I live, if you say a single word, they're next. I had no doubt who they were or what next meant. And then they left. And then, did you call the police? No, I did not call the police. Why not? Because I just witnessed an unimaginable act of violence. Two unimaginable acts of violence. 
And then a man coldly looked at me after he's standing over the body of my dear mother that he skewered and bludgeoned and shows me pictures of my family. So no, I did not call the police. How much longer did you stay there? I stood there numb and incapable of moving for what seemed like minutes. These guys had left. I went upstairs. All I could think about was Janine and the kids and what these monsters could do. And I went and got a small backpack out of my room. I put a few, few clothes, I didn't pack much, some basic toiletries, and I left. So what do you think? It wasn't him. He didn't do it. It was armed intruders, and he gets away without a scratch. And his first thought is, hey, I'm going to flee. I'm going to flee. Because uh, if I, he thought if he went to the jail, they would, these armed people would think, oh, he's gone to the police and they will go back and they'll hurt his wife and kids. So he can't go to the jail. He can't turn himself in. So the defense spends about 10, or the prosecution defense spends about 10 minutes cross-examining him. And she did a good job. She And she just made him out to be a liar. So you lied about this, right? You lied about that, right? But you're not lying about this. No, I'm not lying. Yeah, well. Credibility of the witness is, is something the jury is allowed to consider. I think he would have been much better off if he had a sat at the defendant's table and just kept his mouth shut. And I'm sure that's what his lawyer was thinking. Good God, I doubt he ever told that story to his lawyer because his lawyer would have said, ha, no, <laughs> don't say that <laughs> because it it's just so cockamamie. I, yeah, no, oh my God. Craziness. So after that, the defense rests their case. The judge, because by now it's late afternoon, the judge sends the jury home says, come back in the morning for closing arguments. So after that, they work on the jury instructions for a little bit, and then she adjourns for the day. So that's why I was up so early this morning, because there's going to be closing arguments this morning, and they're on East Coast time. I'm Central, so I'm already an hour behind. Closing arguments, and then the jury will get this case to deliberate and render a verdict. I don't know if it's going to take them very long. I really don't. More coffee. And tonight, 6.30 p.m. Central Time is Craft With Me Wednesday. That's where I do just a crafting live. And tonight I'm going to have my friend Shalene from Shalene's Creativity Room on YouTube. She's going to be there coloring with me. Adult coloring. Color pencils. Yes, adult coloring. Maybe I'll get my Walmart book out. I have the People of Walmart book. It's very funny. Coloring book. Anyway. So tune in for that. Then um, tomorrow night, I'll be doing a special live that will be at 7.30 Central Time. That's where Mickey and I are going to announce our Great Escape diamond painting event that starts August 1st. And we're revealing the canvases that artist Rose Prophet, and she will be there during the live she designed for our event, four diamond painting canvases. I think she said she designed some more as well. They will all go on sale in her store, Rose Profit Creations, and people will be able to purchase those and get them in time to start the event. So you'll want to tune in because no one has seen these canvases yet, except for Mickey and I. Yeah. And I'll show you which one we ordered. And if you guys want to order that one or one of the other ones, Tune in tomorrow night so you can see what these canvases look like. Oh, they're amazing. Anyway, that is the show for today, guys. I hope you enjoyed the content, please. Don't forget to give me a thumbs up. 
if you're inclined to, there is an available button down there. It's called Super Thanks. You can thank me by making a one-time donation to the channel that goes to help support the content of the channel. The games that I stream, those are all courtesy of very generous subscribers. They donate, I buy the games, and then I stream them for you guys to see. So last night I streamed Wildflower, which is super cute. It's really a cute little game. It, there's not much to it really, but next week I'm going to be streaming The Legend of Zelda, the next installment of the Zelda game. Tears of something or other. What is it called? Hold on. Tears of the Kingdom. Yeah, I had to look, and it's a Switch game. I also do Xbox as well sometimes all right guys have a night have a great night i will see you in the next episode if there's a verdict today i will go live with the verdict as well we'll be on verdict watch this afternoon so lots going on that's why i'm up early anyway have a great day bye everybody